30 years. While the arcade version is one of my all-time favorite arcade games, the company assigned to port this classic over to the NES, Micronix, really dropped the ball on this one, plaguing it with unresponsive controls, making Sir Arthur's adventure unnecessarily brutal, even more so than its quarter-gobbling doppelganger. That's right, I said it. Ghosts and Goblins on the NES has unresponsive controls. And, of course, that was met with opposition from a commenter. Now I love Ghosts and Goblins. I've been playing it for 30 years. I grew up with the game. It was one of the very first Nintendo games that I had ever got. Hell, I even have the wall scroll hanging up. But it wasn't until I played the arcade version, maybe 20 years later, and I played it religiously, that I realized that the arcade game is a lot better than the NES port. The NES port I would consider a mediocre game, where the arcade version I think is pretty damn good. So when this commenter didn't agree with me that the NES Ghosts and Goblins has unresponsive controls, I explained to him that I played the arcade version a lot, and that's when I noticed that the NES controls aren't very good. When you play the arcade version a lot, it's hard to miss. So the commenter then went on to say that Ghosts and Goblins NES and Ghosts and Goblins Arcade aren't even that similar, that they really aren't even the same game. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. No freaking way. The arcade and NES versions of Ghosts and Goblins are very similar. I know these games inside and out. But you know how it is arguing with someone on the internet. It's an exercise in futility. So you know what? I went ahead and made a video. I'll let my video do the talking. Roll it. Ghosts and Goblins begins in the outskirts of Demon Village, where two young lovers, Sir Arthur and Princess Prin Prin, embark on an excursion for a quickie. While it may seem strange and a bit macabre to get it on in a boneyard, Giggity. Prin Prin is willing to somewhat wet Arthur's strange and amorous appetite for necrophilia by doing some of the old in and out with Arthur's lance on a freshly covered grave. Relationships are all about compromise. You know how it is when you're trying to get your lady to try new stuff in bed. Am I right, guys? With Arthur stripped down to his skivvies and ready to go, he is suddenly cock-blocked by none other than Satan, who swoops in and snatches up Princess Prin Prin. Now donning his suit of armor with a bad case of blue balls, Sir Arthur sets off on his quest to save his beloved Prin Prin. Let's take a look at this ominous intro for both the arcade and NES versions. The iconic first stage of Ghosts and Goblins hosts a number of reanimated corpses sprouting from the earth, with the enormous Demon Realm castle looming in the background. With the hardware that the arcade version supports, it's no surprise that the graphics have a lot more detail to them versus its NES counterpart. But by no means does that make the NES version bad. For a 1986 title, the visuals for the home version are actually quite good. And the Nintendo version wasn't even developed by Capcom at all. It was developed by Micronix, the same company that brought us AAA titles such as Athena and Super Pitfall, a title I would step over my own mother to possess. Then I will hug some snakes. Yes, I will hug and kiss some poisonous snakes. Now that's sarcasm. With an all-star resume like that, it should come as no surprise that this port has some issues with it. While the scrolling is smooth as silk on the arcade version, Micronic's port of Ghosts and Goblins is extremely choppy, moving frame by frame as you advance the stage. This can be a bit disorienting and seems to affect the response rate for throwing weapons. While you can't really tell just by looking at the footage, the controls on the NES version aren't nearly as tight and responsive as the arcades, and that's not saying much. Now, I'm sure we all know how damage in Ghosts and Goblins works. Arthur takes a hit and his armor flies off, leaving him in his underroos. In the arcade version, Arthur wears white underwear, while in the NES one, he sports red undergarments. Which makes sense, 
Seeing as the limited color palette on the NES would have made Arthur look as if he was going commando had he donned white briefs. Another enemy hit reduces our bearded protagonist to a heap of bones. The enemies and their placements, stage layout, and even the gravestones of the graveyard are all identical in both versions. Even the sorcerer that turns Arthur into a frog is present in the NES version. The arcade does have several treasures that can be picked up for points, which have been omitted from Nintendo's version, although the money bags do remain. On both renditions, enemies will sometimes carry pots containing treasures and different weapons. The notorious Red Arimer makes his first appearance here, and my trick for beating him in the arcade version is to just walk up close and fire away. He'll usually stick to the ground and die easily. On the NES version, not so much. He'll usually retreat for the skies after you approach him, and then he's just a pain in the knickers. Once Arthur makes it past the graveyard and into the forest, there are several minor differences. The stage begins with Phantom Knights, and this is where I always notice differences in the controls. While the controls are a bit stiff in the arcade version, with Arthur at times getting stuck on ladders and in crouches, the NES version takes it to a new level. Crouching to avoid these ghastly knights is often like planting yourself in the dirt. It is sometimes difficult to stand back up to maneuver, and before you know it, Arthur goes Luca Brasi and is sleeping with the fishes. Talk about frustrating. The enemy placements throughout the rest of the stage are pretty much the same in both versions, save for the ghosts that look like flying egg rolls. Apparently, this is the Woody Pig, a pig spirit that is made up of a giant snout with its nostrils resembling eyes. Weird. You know what else it looks like? The piece of foreskin snipped off during a briss. Anyway, their positioning is fair in the arcade version, while in the NES one, they can sometimes be downright cheap appearing exactly where Arthur is standing. The hidden Yashichi, which has awarded players in numerous Capcom games throughout the years, appear in different parts of each game. The arcade version nets you 10,000 points when collected, while in the NES version, the Yashichi will more than likely give you 5 grand. The first boss is the dreaded Unicorn, a nasty cyclops with a horn protruding from his skull. The arcade version plays an ominous boss theme in the background, while the NES version has no boss music whatsoever. The beast attacks identically in both versions before yielding a key, which opens the door leading to the second stage. The arcade game has a message atop the screen and displays the amount of bonus points earned. In between stages and before each new life, a map showing the voyage to Demon Realm Castle is displayed with Arthur's current position marked. You'll be seeing this map in your eyelids when trying to sleep at night. The Ghost Village is the second stage in Ghosts and Goblins. The first half is extremely short, comprised of blue tower-like structures. Again, the layout is exactly the same in both versions, down to the placement of the green monsters. While both versions also have blue demons swarming Arthur, the patterns are different. The second half of Stage 2 is where the game starts getting downright brutal. Arthur has to ascend a building crawling with monsters, and then descend on the other side. The big men are some of the toughest enemies in the game, attacking Arthur by throwing blue projectiles. These hulking bees can even attack from above, so heads up! With ravens flying at you from every angle, the 10 shots it takes to destroy the big men can be a harrowing feat. The layout of the building is once again identical in both versions, even the placements of the big men. I gotta give Micronic some credit here, as they did a superb job in replicating this section of the stage. Even the big men themselves look near identical to their arcade counterparts, down to the cute little heart tattoo. If we zoom in closer, we can actually see... Ghosts and Goblins doesn't have a one-up trick. Unfortunately, with the NES version's questionable controls, getting stuck on ladders adds to the difficulty. As a kid, this was as far as I could get in Ghosts and Goblins. The first difference encountered in this stage is the number of moving platforms that Arthur has to jump across. The NES version also has petite devils flying out of windows, while the arcade version just has meddlesome ravens swooping in. The final boss of Ghost Village is the Unicorn again. Wait, make that two unicorns. The 
The layout and enemy placements within the underground passage to the Demon Realm Castle are exactly the same. Here, we're introduced to the Two-Faced Tower monster, the only stage that he appears in. The second half of the stage of the arcade version hosts a dungeon made up of blue-green tiles, while in the NES version, the tiles are straight up blue. The Red Arimer is a pimp on Arthur's butt in both versions. The end boss is a dragon made up of eight parts, plus its head. The fourth stage begins with moving platforms that Arthur has to traverse to reach the bridge. The main difference here is that in the NES version, you can actually jump through the platforms, making climbing much more forgiving than its quarter goblin doppelganger. The moving platforms on the arcade version are solid, oftentimes pushing Arthur off, and the cause of many annoying deaths. The short bridge has flames leaping up from the lava below, and another encounter with the Red Arimer before concluding once again against a flying dragon. Stage 5 begins at the foot of Demon Realm Castle, with a brutal ascension required to reach Prin Prin. The stage layout and enemy placements are exactly the same in both stages. Starting to notice a trend here? Not only do you have moving platforms to contend with, but skeletons, woody pigs, blue demons, big men, and the Red Arimer all make appearances here as well. This is the first stage that isn't made up of two sections, so dying restarts you all over at the beginning. Once Arthur reaches the top, he encounters Prin Prin's captor, the nefarious Vulcan. After defeating the devil, Arthur finds himself needing to climb one more stage before the final battle. This is one of the toughest stages that I've ever encountered in a video game, period. Every boss in Ghosts and Goblins makes a cameo here. One of the conditions which has to be met in order to face the final boss is defeating stage 6 with the shield weapon equipped. The shield has short range but can destroy enemy projectiles, and for some reason it has no effect on the unicorn in the NES version. Unfortunately, because of its limited range, you have to get up close and personal, and Arthur likes his space. If you finish stage 6 with any weapon other than the shield, you'll be sent back to stage 5 in pursuit of it. It'll be Groundhog Day until you finish stage 6 with the shield, but once you do... The seventh stage is the final showdown between Arthur and the Demon Lord. Astaroth is a despicable demon with two faces who shoots fireballs at a heroic knight. After vanquishing the monster, we find out that, just kidding, the princess is in another castle. Satan, that tricky bastard. The message is the same on both versions, though, what the hell is this? The visit? The visit? Eh, whatever. As most of you probably already know, Ghosts and Goblins can only be beaten on the second go-round. So while we check out this montage of the second quest, let's compare the music in the game. While the tunes are the same in both versions minus any boss themes in the NES one, I feel the arcade sound chip packs a bit more of a punch than its 8-bit counterpart. But hey, you be the judge.
finally defeat Astaroth for real, Prin Prin runs to Arthur and embraces him. Congratulations! This story is happy end. I like the sound of that. Or on the NES, congratulation. Being the wise and courageous, or courager in the NES version, you feel strength welling in your body? That's your blue balls, Arthur. Time to take Princess Prinprin back to the boneyard. Giggity. So there you go, Ghosts and Goblins, Arcade versus NES. As you can see, the two versions are pretty close to each other. In fact, the NES version is a pretty damn faithful port of the arcade original. If it didn't suffer from those terrible controls, it would be a much better game. And maybe if Capcom had developed Ghosts and Goblins on the NES in-house, we would have had much better results. But, whatever. Arcade, Ghosts and Goblins, all freaking day. So, which is your favorite of the two? Or is there even a different version that you like the best? I mean, I think the arcade blows the NES out of the water completely. In fact, I have a new appreciation for the NES version because it is so close to the arcade. But, like I said, those damn controls kind of ruins the game. Ugh. So... Anyway, thanks a lot for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you want to check out some more Versus videos where I compare other games, uh, I got some links in the description below. But until next time, I will catch all of you later.